Hi, I'm Javier. I am going to tell you a very simple story about bears and humans that started long time ago. First of all, I would have liked to meet you in person in Montana. We had even talked with the organization to bring an exhibition about these apiaries to the Congress. I also would have liked to see many colleagues, so I hope we can have another opportunity. Secondly, I want to introduce you to my colleague, friend and also co-author of this communication, Ernesto Diaz. He is the one you can see behind me in the image. This photo is from last year when we went to photograph an old apiary. The route took us a day and a half to finally find it completely collapsed. Later we will see a photo of that apiary taken more than 30 years ago. Okay, now we can start with this story. Our interest in these apiaries began in the 80s when we started to study brown bear distribution in the Cantabrian Mountains. In those works we had to visit the westernmost area. We began to look at the apiaries that served to protect the beehives from wind and cold, fires, thieves, but especially from bears. These apiaries are still preserved in places where there have been no bears for a long time. Many of these apiaries are located far from human settlements, in abrupt and marginal areas for human use. Perhaps this is the reason why they have been overlooked by cultural heritage researchers. But nevertheless they were there, forming a distinguished part of the landscape. It should be added here that for Cantabrian brown bears, beehives, honey and, especially, bee larvae, form a significant part of their diet. In fact, the Cantabrian bear population in the European context is the one that has the greatest impact on beekeeping farms, as you can see in this recent work about the damage caused by European bear populations to livestock and agriculture. It should also be noted that honey harvest in the Iberian Peninsula has one of the earliest known testimonies of honey recollection by our species. This is attested by cave paintings. Also, already at the beginning of our era we find testimonies of Roman writers and historians of the importance of beekeeping in the Iberian Peninsula. Thus, you can see that our story started centuries ago, before historical times. The constructive typology of these apiaries has prehistoric characteristics. They are generally circular constructions. They are built following the traditional dry stone technique, stacking stones one on top of the other, without using any other material. The dry stone technique has recently been catalogued by UNESCO as intangible cultural heritage. Apiary's main distribution is restricted to Spain and Portugal, although we know of a few dozen similar apiaries in the French Alps Maritimes. The highest density is found in the extreme west of the Cantabrian Mountains and the Mountains of Leon, overlapping in large areas with the current distribution of the brown bear. As mentioned above, these constructions seem to have been conceived mainly for the purpose of keeping the beehives out of the reach of brown bears. These traditional beehives that we found inside are made of bark, wood or hollow tree trunk. Apiaries have walls several meters high and an overhanging eave made of stone, of large dimensions, which makes access difficult. The doors are small in size, which makes them more resistant to pushing and shoving. Sometimes they do not have a door, being necessary to access with the help of a ladder.
Here you can see another apiary, in this case with a wood nave. In spite of the primitive nature of these constructions, in some cases, these apiaries have very important dimensions and incorporate certainly elaborated construction techniques. Such as the system of seats for the beehives or the indoor scaffolding in their walls, thus making their construction and repair possible. There are also other constructive typologies, even more rustic, where the beehives are protected and kept sheltered from natural accidents but reinforced by walls and eaves, configuring all typologies with an evident relationship between them. This is the apiary photographed 30 years ago that I mentioned at the beginning that we visited last year and that is now totally abandoned and ruined. Here are other photos of these apiaries, less common than those with circular walls. Some apiaries have other wall shapes, like the one that you can see in this image with these kind of towers. They are located in the areas with the highest density of apiaries and where the diversity of typologies is greater. We estimate that currently there are no more than 2,000 of these apiaries and that less of 300 are in an acceptable conservation status. The loss of these constructions represents the loss of a material heritage. It is remarkable that this patrimonial loss has been happened in the last decades. You can see the same apiary photographs 25 years apart. We have been collecting materials on these apiaries for several years, working on partial inventories of some areas, and on photographic and divulgation projects. The interest in the apiaries of the administrations and some conservation foundations is increasing but it may be too late. We are currently working with the Museum of the People of Istria on a project to transfer all the unpublished photographic, cartographic and inventory material that we have been accumulating over the years. It is necessary that professionals and those responsible for heritage conservation take responsibility for this cultural heritage. But we also believe that the conservation of a material heritage such as the one we have described may depend on recovering its use. Even allowing the combination of its traditional typology with modern prevention systems, as for example electric fences placed on the walls. Research carried out in the Cantabrian mountains where both these apiaries and bears are present, show how the combination of prevention systems, including walls, reduce the risk of attack on the beehives. This is a very effective method as it also keeps the electric cables away from contact with the vegetation. These apiaries are part of the history of coexistence between bears and humans. Their loss is a loss of human cultural heritage. But also of the Cantabrian bear culture. This has been the story we wanted to tell you. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for listening this talk.
And today I'm presenting here about our result on investigation of brown bear poaching in Mongolia using genetic approaches. So scientific knowledge is very important to understand the population status and threats and managing the populations. So when population is small, uh, have low genetic diversity isolated, uh, one of the conservation measures is legal protection, but not everyone follow the regulations. Mm, and there's a concern for illegal take. And uh, many people kill wildlife and do wildlife crimes. And we need to understand which species are most harvested and uh, how many number of them were killed, location of killings, and also demographic information about population, for example, sex and age. And those information are very important and hard to obtain and, uh, and can help with the prevent from this uh, wildlife crimes. And we using genetic approach, we can answer most of those questions except the age. And brown bears distribution extended throughout Northern Hemisphere. However, historical distribution of brown bears decreased and many brown bears are fragmented, become small. And in Central Asia, the scientific information are very limited especially in the northern part of Mongolia there, and government, uh, Mongolian government reports that there are only 250 individuals left. And we don't have the knowledge of the accurate population size density and survival rate or those demographic parameters. But we also, there's population also have very you know, high traits to this region. And for the legal status, um, brown bears are included in the CITES, the Mongo those bears, and then Gobi bears are in CITES 1 and Northern Region are in Appendix 2. And uh, for national level, the hunting is prohibited for Gobi bears to 1953 and brown bears in the North 2005. And uh, we all know gobi bears are critically endangered, but brown bears are now endangered status. It listed in the red book and also IUCN red list. So 21% of the distributional range in Mongolia is in protected areas. And when we look at the, the illegal take, this human employment, what is wildlife, there's 15 cases of illegal take on brown bears. So this is very high number. It's just only 2020. There are many years of this kind of data on just looking at the website, uh, internet information. And we have limited knowledge on this wildlife crime. So we collaborated, worked with uh, IBA, Mongolia Academy of Sciences, in the Ecological Laboratory of National Institute of Forensic Science in Mongolia and collected 81 samples, skin and tissue samples. Most samples came from paws or skin. And uh, police collect those samples in one place and no idea which paw sample was from where. And of course, collect each of those samples. And we don't have the geographical origin and also six um, from those samples. So our questions were to how many individuals are found in illegally harvested bear parts? Is it legal take more common in males or females? Where are the origin of illegally harvested bears? Do any bears come from highly at risk population? For example, Gobi. And to answer those questions, we included the data from our previous publication which had the known geographic locations. And uh, we had the data from 13 nuclear microsite data and also mitochondrial DNA sequences. For laboratory analysis, we sequenced uh, mitochondrial control region, uh, COX-2 genotyped 
uh, individuals with microspellulas. I also use six marker. In that analysis, we identified individual ID and then also run principal coordinate analysis and structure analysis. They included also the known region on this analysis. And with the hundred day in that uh, analysis, we uh, did uh, uh, build a phylogenetic tree and included uh, known haplotypes. Previously, we detected from known samples and also gene bank data. For the results, we extracted 81 samples, uh, extracted DNA from those number of samples with the unknown origin, and successfully generated with 62 samples. And based from this, we found 31 unique individuals. For mitochondrial DNA, we sequenced 39 samples. Mm, and we totally 13 haplotypes we found, and three were known, 10 were new haplotypes. Um, so our results, we found 31 unique individuals from illegally harvested bear parts. And second result, we found relatively similar number of females and males found in, in illegal take samples. And looking at the known regions, we see that also a very similar number of males and females harvested. And overall, and PCA principal coordinate analysis showed that no illegal intake take were uh, found in Gobi or Pakistan bear populations. And then red highlighted the regions that they illegal take. And they were mostly found in the northern part of the region. So we wanted to clarify more this result and run uh, BSN clustering. And here we found uh, key equals seven showed more of the uh, clustering information which made sense on the geographic region. It was most likely clustering. And when we look at this plot, the highlighted parts that the illegal take, and we have the detailed uh, information of geographic origin of the known uh, the samples. And it's unknown samples comparing those similar genotypes. We assume that those uh, illegal take are most likely from this region with similar genotypes. We also looked at the mitochondrial DNA results. And uh, we, as we expected, we found 3B and 3A bears. And we previously found 3A bears. And, and we all, it was interesting to see legally hunted bears from also those A bears, three A bears. Uh, those bears are most widely distributed throughout Eastern Europe to North uh, Russia. And for three B bears, we found most of brown bears are not throughout Northern Mongolia were three B bears. So those bears are found also they show some geographic locations for certain haplotypes, and it was useful to see the origin as well. So we combined those two results um, and uh, put those samples uh, in the for potential geographic locations. So these two samples are from this Altang region, these five samples from Cyan region. And uh, most of samples from Puteling Noro Hinti region. And there were different uh, structures there in this region. And interesting result was this uh, three A bears also show different clustering there. And we previously found three A bears on only this region. And it's also confirmed that uh, this illegally take bears from those regions as well. So now we'll discuss the results. We found 31 um, individuals from illegal tech and bear hunting is a one of the main wildlife crimes in this region. And 
those spare parts are used many different purposes, traditional uh, medical purposes or trading to China and superstitions. And we are now know that not all samples are from different individuals. The bare parts are separated in different families and people and the animals are divided and sold on the markets. Uh, so we found that there are similar number of females and males and seems no preference of killing the sex of bears. And we've also found several cubs paws there and that was very sad to see. And the more females were hunted from Hinti and Putelling mountain region. So further studies should clarify more of the sex ratio age of the population, how this poaching has affected those parameters. For the geographic origin of illegally hunted bears, uh, we were able to clarify this. And then this is one first genetic study addressing these illegal hunting issues on bears in Mongolia. It is important to continue the study and understand more of the demographic impacts of poaching. And this method can help monitor the illegal hunting bear, find solution, and prevent from future wildlife crimes. So in the future, the increased wildlife bear conflicts, um, it's going to increase human wildlife co uh, conflicts because of limited resources, and increasing number of forest fires, for example, Siberia. And uh, more bears are showing closer to human settlements and herders of zero so much. And then there's maybe more of wildlife crimes, more deaths of bears. So we are developing SNPs panel um, for Mongolian brown bears for further monitoring. And this is very powerful tool. And bear hunting is a not national issue. It's an international issue because bears don't uh, have borders that, uh, and countries have different measures there. And also comparing this type of understanding this issue, data can be comparable depending on quality and different markers or uh, limited data. And international organization can be useful in this. And also locals should be very proactive and let this to work and an opportunity to work with neighboring countries. And same technique can apply to other wildlife in Mongolia and all this can help with the conservation. Thank you for your attention and please send your questions if you have any. Hello, my name is Vat Toktok. Greetings from Mongolia. Today I want to introduce some result of our study. The study has been carrying out in Great Kobe A, strictly protected area. Total area is 4.6 million hectare. The brown bear is geographically isolated in inaccessible harsh desert areas of Transalta Kobe in southwestern Mongolia and have been studied very little. Most of the habitat dry and true desert. You can see here we of the Habitat, mountains, dry white valley, and stony desert. Only few water sources in the Gobi. Still, there not enough scientific information about endangered mammals of Transalta Gobi. Not many long-term monitoring studies. Hard to conduct line transect and tracking survey. 
Some of mammals are night active and you as from the desert harsh conditions is a strict field survey in longer periods. We planned two kinds of study. First study aimed to determine seasonal and circadian activity of brown bear and overlaps with other large mammals. Based on this information, a second study was designed in order to determine the population size during the period of greater activity at 13 natural spring in the whole protected area. We want to contribute conservation management plan for mammalian biodiversity in the Transalta Gobi Desert. Fourth camera trap study was conducted at main six natural spring from 2015 to 2017 with five to eight camera deployed on each water source. You can see on the picture how we put our camera traps around water source. We don't want to lose any single animal picture. Second camera trap study determined the population size. So we put our camera trap around 13 different main water source in the whole protected area. We divided in three of these complexes as Atosingis, Scharholst, Salambot. We done in summer of 2018 and 2020. We tried to identify every individual of the brown bean based on their shoulder mark pattern. And picture were evaluated by three researchers independently. You can see on the picture only one individual unit brown bear. You, you can easily identify it outside. Camera was possible to capture medium and large mammals at right angle to trail, avoid from mountain shade and sunrise and sunset direction. Also correct date and time programmed. We use such camera trap model, which is with flashlight. It gives us chance to work in night time. You know the camera trap, good to learn, good to long-term monitoring study, non-invasive technique queue, and it's possible to identify their pattern, suitable detect elusive and night active animals. Also monitoring illegal activities. Now I want to show you the some result of our study. We detected 13 different species mammal. Brown bear was one of the most observed species. You can see on the picture which captured the mammals by camera trap. Also some raptors. Seasonal activity of brown bear showed a clumped 
seasonal activity in the area with a peak around the first half of June. Active beer were detected from early March to early October. The circadian activity showed a clump distribution with mainly nocturnal activity, which means is uh, midnight, not affected by lunar pulse. The circadian activity pattern was similar across months, but from September down and dusk peaks activity were found. Activity overlap. Daily overlap was detected with duration links. You can see here on the picture the wild donkey and gobby bear. The brown bear avoiding to overlap on water source. Estimate population in 2018. We captured over 4,000 pictures of brown bear. Average congruence among observers resulted in 33 to 36 individuals. Only four male and one female were observed in more than of this complex. Here is an example picture. You can see six different individual at one temperature point. Also, you can easily identify every individual based on their shoulder white mark. In 2020, we captured over 1,000 pictures totally. Average congruence among observers resulted in 27 to 31 individuals. Only three men were observed in more than of this complex. Also, you can see the example picture, five different individuals at one camera point. Also, the white marking shape looks different. Also, you can easily identify the individual. We recorded also newborn calves every year since 2014 to 2020. Also two years old, twin cubs with her mother. The brown bee emerged from hibernation in early March, showed a peak of activity around the first half of June, which overlapped with the hottest period and were less dependent on waterhole from mid-August until the start of hibernation. This autumn pattern may be related their reference for Netraria berries and Epidra fruit during fall, which are good water sources. Their activity was primarily nocturnal, probably avoiding the hot day daytime condition since in many other environments, the species is highly diurnal. The population size has been estimated between before 20 to 80 individuals. Recently, the community also estimated the population based on genetic study. Our study also showing us almost similar result. We will do our monitoring study, continue in the Gobi Desert. Thank you for uh, collaborating 
with us and thank you for your attention. We will be happy to collaborate with you also. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. This is Shagun Thakur. I'm a senior research fellow in the Wildlife Institute of India. I've been working on large mammals in the Western Himalaya since 2015 under the supervision of Professor Sapit Marsan. I'll just share the screen with you. So, today I'll be sharing some information on the conservation status of Himalayan brown bear and Asiatic black bear in Madhya Basin of the Uttarakhand region, as well as the Great Himalayan National Park in the River Basin. Both the city areas lies in Western Himalaya, India. Now, India has four species of bears, uh, starting from Himalayan brown bear, Asiatic black bear, sloth bear, and sun bear. The Western Himalayas has two species, which are namely Himalayan brown bear and Asiatic black bear. I'll be discussing about these two species in my presentation. The Asiatic black bear is distributed in the Himalayas as well as in the Southeast Asia and East Asia. This is the Himalaya, Himalayas of the Indian Himalayan region showing the distribution of Asiatic black bear. In the Indian Himalayan region, Asiatic black bear is distributed in the southern part of the Greater Himalayas as well as in the Northeast Hills. In Himalayas, it prefers the elevation from 1200 meters up to 3500 meters square, as in Northeast, it prefers the elevation range from 70 meters up to 4600 meters. The habitat preferences of this bear species are generally broadleaf and heavily forested coniferous forests. The estimated population in India is around 6,000. The brown bear is by far the most widely distributed species of horses in the world and lies in the globally and lies in the least concerned status globally. But there are some isolated populations which are threatened, such as Himalayan brown bear, which is critically endangered as per the IUCN red list. Here is the location of Himalayan region in the India in India and showing the distribution of Himalayan brown bear. In Indian Himalayan region, the distribution of Himalayan brown bear goes through Western Himalayan states and Union territories of Jammu and Kashmir, Ladakh, Himachal Pradesh, and Uttarakhand, and it prefers the elevation range from 3,000 3, meters up to 2,500 meters. It prefers habitats such as alpine scrubs, meadows, which are generally above the tree line, and the estimated population from India is around 300 individuals. Objective of my study was to assess the distribution of habitat overlap between the Himalayan brown bear and the Asiatic black bear in relation to the anthropogenic pressure in the western Himalaya. Study sites were selected. First was the Bhagirathi Basin from Uttarakhand region, which is around 7586 square kilometers in area. It encompasses the elevation ranging range from 500 meters to 5500 meters. The Gangotri National Park lies in Bhagirathi region, surrounded by forested habitats outside the protected area. To survey evenly, we put around 209 camera trap locations, but grid by sampling was carried out. We had 38 cells of each of 256 square kilometers, which were further divided into four by four square kilometer cells and three to four such four by four grids were deployed through camera traps. The, we selected such larger grid size based on the average home range of the largest mammal, which is the Himalayan brown bear present in the area. The lower elevation zones were heavily covered with villages, which is generally lying, which were generally lies in the in the elevation range below 2000 meters. The camera trapping revealed uh, the habitat use patterns of both the bear species. The photo capture rates showed that Asiatic black bear is typically using the temperate habitats, whereas Himalayan brown bear is found uh, uh, above the tree line in the narrow subalpine and alpine habitats. Anthropogenic pressures also reveal that there are high human presence, basically mainly in the form of mass religious tourism, as well as livestock grazing is also present in the Madhya Basin. We compared the anthropogenic pressures from inside and outside protected areas. 
though the human presence was low in summer inside the protected area, but livestock grazing and feral rain, feral or free ranging dogs were presence were high in the in inside protected area as compared to outside. We did GLMM and uh, for this we used repeated camera trap site, repeated sampling from similar sites. We used data from both the seasons or from either summer season or winter season. For uh, Himalayan brown bear, we used only summer season data to do winter hibernation and it was found that Himalayan brown bear is found in the narrow elevation range in the alpine and subalpine habitats. For Asiatic black bear, it was found that it is occurring with the where the livestock pressure is high and photo capture rates of Asiatic black bears were comparatively low in winter season than summer. Since the presence of humans inside the in the Bhagirathi Basin was comparatively low in winter season, we only analyzed data from summer season for temporal activity overlap. It was found that Himalayan brown bear was largely overlapping, temporally overlapping with livestock, but in case of Asiatic black bear, the highest overlap was found with dogs followed by livestock and humans. The other study area was Great Himalayan National Park in Bias Basin, which was around 765 square kilometers. It forms the headwaters of River Sutlej. This national park has an eco zone and a core zone in which we followed the same grid by standard of sampling as in the Bhagirathi Basin. The photo capture rates revealed some interesting results which showed that brown bear was regularly utilizing temperate habitats and thereby indicating in habitat overlap with Asiatic black bear. Overall anthropogenic pressure through photo capture rates revealed that in four zone of national park there is high human presence followed by the presence of free ranging or feral dogs though the livestock pressure was comparatively lower from the eco zone in the eco than in the eco zone of national park. Temporal activity among the two bears in GHNP showed around 70 percent of overlap among the two species, which shows that brown bear is regularly utilizing the damper habitats. Compare, comparison of temporal activity with the anthropogenic pressure showed that brown bear is the highest overlap in case of brown bear was with humans, which was around 61%. And similarly, in case of Asiatic black bear, it also showed highest overlap with humans, which was around 45%. We did Two species of pensy modeling through Bayesian framework. Since our data was small, Bayesian uh, framework was used for robust data estimation. It was revealed that there is 98% certainty that both the species are occurring spatially. This graph also here shows the two values, which indicates the probability. First one is the side B1, which indicates the probability of occupancy of black bear in the absence of brown bears. And the second one shows the increased probability of occupancy in presence of brown bears, which shows that the both, both the species are spatially co-occurring as black bears occur. Black bears' occupancy probability is increasing in presence of brown bear. Now, the results from Bhagirathi Basin were that highest overlap between brown bear and livestock was observed, which was around 80%. This co-occurring with livestock potentially enhanced livestock depredation by the brown bear. In case of black bears, highest temporal overlap was between with the domestic dog, which, around, which was around 51%. And it was also found that brown bears are preferring higher elevation areas. Whereas in GHNP Bias Basin, highest overlap between brown bear and humans were found, which was 61%. And similar in case of Asiatic black bear, which was around 45% with humans. It was also uh, an interesting result which was found from GHNP that they are both the bear species are temporally overlapping with around 69% overlap between the two or six species. Also, the black bear probability of occupancy is increases, increasing in presence of Himalayan brown bear, which indicates spatial co occurrence. The conclusions from my study could be that the both study sites are subjected to high anthropogenic pressures. Brown bears and black bears are co-occurring in areas with high anthropic pressure leading to human bear conflicts. In GHNP, spatial overlap between brown and black bears in temperate habitats, but they are avoiding competition probably by temporal segregation. 
with this my co-authors and i would like to thank following organizations and individuals i would also like to thank iba for giving me this opportunity and also giving me a grant to present in this conference thank you okay i can start off here welcome to the session bears of eurasia um I'm, my name is Lana Traniello. I will be one of your moderators today, and the other moderator is Krishnadatta. We have a truly great session for you today. We're going um, from Mongolia and India around the Cantabrian Mountains. So I will begin by introducing two speakers here. The first one is Bet Tok Tok. Nasbat and Betoktok is from Mongolia. He works as a wildlife biologist at the Institute of Biology, Mongolian Academy of Sciences. He is also a PhD student at the Czech University of Life Sciences, Prague. He studies population demography, movement, behavior, habitat suitability, and diet of large and mid-sized mammals in Mongolia. The title of his presentation population size movements and activity patterns of brown bears in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. The next speaker I will introduce is Atbayer Tembrem. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Atbayer Tembremberlin. Um, she is from Mongolia. She is currently working at the University of Wyoming as a research scientist and studying brown bears in Mongolia. She uses the genetic approach to study population demography um, phylogeography and evolution. The title of her presentation is Investigation of Brown Bear Poaching in Mongolia Using Genetic Approaches. And I'm glad to introduce uh, the other two speakers. Um, Javier is, is logging in here from Spain uh, and he studies the bears in the Cantabrian Mountains, people who live next to these bears and stories that are related to bears, like the presentation, if you saw it. Um, hopefully you have. <laughs> um, he wanted to say that um, he wants to send a greeting to everyone he met at IBA, but especially those who met in his work, and uh, especially while he was in Montana in the 90s. So like everyone else, I think we all would have preferred this to be in person. Um, so. Hopefully this will happen in the future, Javier. The title of his presentation is Bears, Bees and Humans, a shared story on the traditional apiaries in the Northwest of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and our fourth, but not the last, um, sorry, the, uh, the fourth speaker is Shagun Thakur. She's a senior research fellow in the Wildlife Institute of India. And she's been working on large carnivores in Himalaya since 2015 specifically in the Western part um, in India. She's uh, been in this field for six years, but uh, really enjoys being out in the field because it, it feels like it's the first time. And she had a curious close encounter with a Himalayan brown bear, she says, that if we have time, we can ask her to elaborate upon. Um, the title of her talk is uh, Conservation Status of Himalayan Brown Bear and Asiatic Black Bear in Bhagirathi and Vyas River uh, Basins, Western Himalaya, India. So with these introductions, we will just open the floor to anyone who has questions for specific speakers. Um, please raise your hand and you can un unmute yourself or type in the chat, whichever works. So maybe while we are uh, waiting for questions to come in, maybe I can start. Uh, Udbayar, I actually had a question for you. Um, on the generic approach you use to identify these um, um, these brown bears, there was no, just to clarify, there was no reason to run a species ID, was it? The tissue samples you had were clearly from brown bear and- uh, for, for brown bears, it uh, wasn't that necessary because we already knew it was brown bear, but in general, it's just, yeah, just introduction was possible to use species ID. But all the tissue samples that you had were visibly from brown bears. Yeah. Like all samples we had um, for gobi bears, we used the species ID, just the 
that was the different studies, but in general for uh, skin sample or tissue samples, we knew it's from brown bears. But uh, run all samples with species ID, just uh, the first step, just, yeah. Okay. Martha has a question. Can she unmute herself? Yes, I can, I guess, because I did it. So okay. <laughs> hi, hi, everyone. It's good to see your faces, Lara. It was great to hear your voice. And Alka, it was great to see your talk as well. And I have a question for you, Alko. So you said um, that this was the first study um, that addressed illegal killing in Mongolia. So you, I guess uh, you don't have something to compare with, but uh, at this point, but based on your impression or based on your knowledge of the, the system and, and of how things are, are going in Mongolia. Um, do you think the situation um, is improving or is it getting worse in, in terms of illegal killing? So first, uh, uh, I was able to compare um, the illegal 100 samples uh, with my previous study data. And those samples had the samples from known regions and already have the genotyping information, also the mitochondrial DNA haplotype information from those certain locations in Mongolia. And for illegal hunted samples, didn't know the geography location, but I was able to compare. Uh, for, um, in general, like looking at this illegal crime for wildlife, so for brown bear was the one of the highest um, uh, crimes in Mongolia. And just looking at like in Mongolia recently, there's a one uh, government uh, organization established, ecological police uh, office. And they kind of recorded all this um, uh, bear hunting and other also wildlife. In just 2020, there was uh, on presentation was 15 cases. Mm. Yeah, that was a lot. And in general, like we see occasionally, like it uh, shows on the uh, news, like there are people um, captured, um, had tried to um, transfer the samples to China or somewhere they were keeping that illegal samples in their homes or in those are mostly like um, shows on the news. And I was able to also look at that and it was really concerned. And I think it's a really serious issue in general and just want to clarify a little bit where they are killing most. Okay. But based on your impression, is this something that maybe is it um, diminishing the level of illegal killing compared maybe to the past or, or it's increasing? So it's uh, hard to evaluate to for now yeah. because it's just uh, looking at this now. Yeah. And I can check it more in the future. Okay. Thanks. Okay, we have two participants with their hands raised. Well, one is Marta. She can put her hand down if she doesn't have a next question. Okay. Do you want to figure so out the other one? Uh, hello, um, am I audible? Yeah. Okay, so uh, my question is for Obair. Um, I liked your talk. And I have two questions. So my first question is about uh, these individuals and it seems that most of these individuals or all of them in fact, uh, that were poached or confiscated were from Northern side of Mongolia, Northern population. None of them were from Gobi uh, population. 
which is probably a good news. Um, but why the poaching pressure is more on northern populations than none of these Gobi bears were touched? Why is it so? Uh, that's my first question. And my second question is that uh, somewhere in your talk, you said that a SNP panel is under development. So uh, if you are getting your answers from microsets, uh, 13 microsets, then why do you think a SNP panel is required? Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Um, so first question, why not from Gobi and then not more from Northern region? Um, so Gobi bears are critically endangered and there are very few lakes and those are in a strictly protected area. Not many people can enter to that is strictly a protected area as well. And I'm sure that influence. And also another thing is most Mongolians uh, think as a Gobi bear is a, as a national pride. And um, I don't think anyone want to kill Gobi bear. And we didn't find any sample from our legal take. That's really good. And for the SNPs panel, why we are developing is not just for this study, it's generally it's a much powerful tool than uh, microsets uh, because especially when population is small, we are able to identify the relatives or the future monitoring. It can help a lot to understand the, even comparing the other populations, the connectivity that will be much powerful. And for that purpose, uh, they would love in the SNPs panel for Mongolian brown bears. Thank you. All right. Martha has another question, it seems like. <laughs> okay, sorry, I was uh, muted again. Yeah, I have a question for, not sure I can pronounce correctly the name, but uh, Batog Tok. Okay, so um, in, in your study, you've used camera traps for, yeah. for the copy bear. Yeah. And I was wondering, since for the Gobi bear also, um, a genetic monitoring has been applied. I was wondering if you have thought or if there is the, the idea um, to, um, to merge, to combine the two techniques to get a better uh, coverage or to improve detection of these so elusive uh, species that is also very hard to study and, and is endangered. So I was wondering if there are, what, what you think about it or, and then there are methods out there now, like uh, the integrated, um, integrated models that allows to combine methods from, um, allows to combine data from different methods. So I was wondering if, if you have thought about it. Yeah, we put our camera in the garbage itself for the detect population uh, size. But yeah, you are right. We need to combine with some genetic study with support our camera trap study. It will be more uh, accuracy will be improved, yeah? The, the, check the number of the probably bears. Unfortunately, the, the bear and the sample is uh, um, difficult to collect somehow. We try to collect a fresh fecal sample. Unfortunately, in the public desert, mostly in the uh, summertime on the ground, the uh, plus, plus uh, 70 degrees Celsius. So uh, after one hour, they already dry the fecal sample. So it's hard to collect a fresh sample. Right. Um, Otka and 
we are talking about uh, collaborating on our data and trying to combine our study. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be great that maybe your data and Alco's data could be combined because I know, Otko, if I remember from your past work that there was some bias in, in the sex ratio. I don't know. I don't remember anymore if you were detecting more females or more males. I, I don't remember. Um, but in any way, it, it's like the good thing of using two methods sometimes is that you can compensate uh, the biases of, of the other method. Or, and, and so that, that just might be useful. I agree. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hey, great questions, Marta. Uh, Sandeep, is your hand still up there? Yeah, I have. I have another question. Uh, if I may ask that. Absolutely. Sure. So uh, my question is for Javier, and uh, if you can listen uh, to me, Javier, am I audible to you? Okay. So my question is uh, regarding uh, one of the slides where you had shown uh, a paper that was published in 2017 uh, about continent-wide uh, diet of bears um, for entire Europe, where you had shown that the bears in your region have the highest proportion uh, of bees or uh, uh, bee-derived products in their diet. And uh, I'm intrigued, why is it so? Why the bears are eating um, bees and bee derived products disproportionately more in your area? So that's my question. The second thing is that I really liked your talk. I really enjoyed watching all those pictures. It was pretty unusual for me to see that, those kind of pictures. Amazed that um, uh, it's World Heritage Sites. Some of those uh, apiaries are World Heritage Sites. So, Thanks for your talk. Hello. Okay, uh, Sandra, can you repeat me the first question because I don't understand too much English. Uh, Manuel can help me. Uh, can you repeat sure. the, the first question? Sure, 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 sure. So my question was regarding one of the papers that you had shown in your uh, um, talk where uh, the diet of bear from your region has disproportionately large component of bees and bee derived products. Why is it so compared to other regions of Europe? That's Manuel and he's gonna translate for Javier. Uh, so one moment, one moment, please, one moment. <laughs> Take your time, no problems. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, oh, Sandeep, the, the answer for your question is that the, here in Spain, uh, the use of the bees in the diet of the brown bear is uh, due to the uh, necessary to use insects in the diet during some uh, times during the year. And here in Spain, we have not the same disponibility of uh, variability of uh, ants like in other parts of Europe. And we have the tradition to use the, uh, the, farm, the bee farmers Every farms. So this is the the, the answer of the uh, of the question that uh, Burr here use a more disproportional uh, use of the bees uh, than in other parts of Europe. More or less, I think. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks for your answer. Yes. And the second question, please. Ah, uh, no, it was not a question. It was a compliment to your study. I really like your pictures. Okay. I see Marta's hand come up again. I think these two have divided it. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Good job, Sandeep, but 
yeah, I'm trying to keep up with you with questions. So that's all about it. Um, no, I have no, another I question after your question. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. No, I, since uh, it was for Javier, I also had a question for Javier because I, I really, I also found the, your um, presentation very interesting and fascinating to see these um, these apiaries. I also didn't know um, that um, they were such typical in, in the Cantabrian. And you said that um, these um, apiaries are part of a, a story of human bear coexistence. And also you suggest that they, they should be reused. Um, and uh, you, you, you showed some of them that had some electric um, wire, but I'm wondering, is that really happening now? Are these APRs being reused widely or is, uh, or, st or still not? It's just a suggestion that you, you put out there. Uh, one moment, Marta. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Don't worry. Take okay. your time. <laughs> I have that same question, Marta. That's okay. Awesome. I have a follow up on that one too when he's done <laughs> with okay. the translation. I'll just talk through them sorting out the answer. But yeah, that was very interesting. Uh, yeah. Talking, seeing them and the, and the construction and, that went into that. Holy. I yeah, beautiful to see. Cake. Yeah, it makes me feel like I want to go hike over there to just to go see them like uh, yeah I'm yeah. coming with you all right okay, back. okay. <laughs> we'll organize we'll organize that okay okay hello Marta <laughs> yes uh, well the answer uh, from Javier is that uh, yes he suggests the use of these uh, these appearance to to um, use uh, uh, with the actual uh, electric fences but it's not uh, usually to use this in, in that moment in the in the Cantabrian mountains, but he suggests that because it's a good way to demonstration to uh, uh, use these uh, constructions that are in the Cantabrian mountains and that and conserve like a, a culture and ethnographic heritage together with the use for the uh, beekeepers to, to protect the these populations. Okay. Okay, I see. Okay, so maybe you, can we come visit that, Javier, one of these days? Lana is also interested. I'm sure Sandeep is as well, and, and Trishna. Maybe we'll, we'll organize it to come visit. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> okay. <hope>. Awesome. <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask a question following up on Marta's question to Javier. Um, so, like the doors look like they were wooden and stuff. Are there old scratch marks from the extinct populations on the apiaries? Can you see old bear signs where, where bears are trying to get into the structure? I was just thinking because around here with our cave dens and things, you can always see old sign. Okay, yes. Uh, in these uh, small doors in these appearance, you can see marks of the of the birds trying to to enter inside the the apiary. And in in old times, people try to defend uh, also this door with I don't know, see clubs like. Um, oh. Met uh, iron uh, oh. iron club, yeah, yeah, uh, to defend also the doors uh, to to the trying bird to enter in the apiary. Okay. Oh, and now, great. And now change uh, with metal doors. Oh, okay, and now change and, 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 and now it's changing these yeah. doors with iron doors to be more uh, strong. Okay. That's great. Sandeep, I see you're back. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm sorry if nobody is asking questions. No, it's questions. It's great. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> okay, so uh, my question this time is for Shagun, and um, uh, so 
I, I really like the talk um, for two reasons. One of them is that you don't see uh, ecological studies on two different bear species uh, from that part of the world that much. And second, the spatial replication that you have. So you uh, have one site from uh, GHNP and other site from Bhagirathi Basin, which is really interesting. So kudos to you and Dr. Sati Kumar uh, for this study. Thank you. Uh, my question is regarding um, one of your results where you said that in GHNP, uh, you found Himalayan brown bear more in temperate region. Uh, which is, I think, if I, I'm looking at your slide, says that around 45 um, pictures were from temperate region, where in alpine region, you just found 12 pictures. So why is it so uh, Himalayan brown bears, they prefer alpine region, um, whereas here you didn't find them uh, that much in alpine region and they're more into temperate region. And uh, my second question was regarding uh, your grid size. So from Bhagirathi Basin, your grid size is, I think, 16 by 16 kilometer. Uh, and then you had subcells in them. Whereas uh, in GHNP, the cell size was, I think, four kilometers square, uh, if I interpreted that correctly. So does it have any effect on the results that you have found? Thank you. Hi, thanks for the questions. So yeah, for the first question, uh, as you asked that the brown bear captures are more in the temperate region as compared to the alpine areas. So I have two reasons for that. In GHNP, uh, in the alpine regions especially, there was this peak season for medicinal plant, which was from April till September. And uh, we found humongous anthropogenic disturbances in the alpine regions. And uh, this I could say as one of the major region, reasons for the brown bear to be found in the temperate habitats. And the second reason was also similar to the anthropogenic disturbances as we suffer a loss, lot of camera trap loss from the alpine regions, mainly because of the presence of humans in the alpine regions. So yeah, those two reasons I would say could be could possibly be the answer to a question, which we uh, showing that the brown bear was more in the temperate regions, and hence it uh, it ecologically overlapped with the uh, Asiatic black bear. And for a second question, uh, yeah, we did same sampling strategy for GHNP also. It was sixteen by sixteen square kilometer grid and further subdivided into four by four. So yeah, the methodology was the same for both the river basins. Thank you. So when you said that uh, in GHNP, you have more anthropogenic dis disturbance in alpine region, uh, was it because of uh, grazing or uh, medicinal plant collection or something else? The major was for the medicinal plant collection. Livestock grazing was mainly in the eco zone area though we did find evidences in the core area as well, but mainly it was the it was for the medicine plant collection. Thanks. If I can tag along uh, with that medicinal plant question, um, yeah. is there any data to show how this, what the trajectory or the trend is for medicinal plant and the threat because of this? Um, because I think this is uh, quite a big reason that that is somehow not out there. I mean, people talk about it, but there's no data out there to show how this has increased over time. Do you, do you know of any yeah. sort of study? Yeah, yeah. We actually did some questionnaire survey initially to follow up for this medicine plant collection happening in the national park, but eventually we had to stop due to time constraints and all. But yeah, the forest department do have data on this, which we can follow up. Okay, so is there like a, what is it exactly like? Is there like a quota? Questionnaire, semi-questionnaire like semi surveys, interviews, as well as the local authorized traders, we have interviews in them also. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I'd like to follow up on, on actually the co-occurrence of the presence of, um, so you had that the black bear probability of co-occurrence increased in the presence of brown bears um, 
indicating co-occurrence for the species and and you had them um, uh, basically thriving together. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and can you explain maybe a bit more about that and the differing what you think is going on there? Yeah, so apart from spatial co-occurrence, we also uh, assess the temporal overlap. So temporal overlap showed that the brown bear is showing cathemeral behavior, mainly active during the daytime as well as the nighttime. Whereas the Asiatic black bear is showing, showing crepuscular behavior active during day and night. So I would say this is how both the species are segregating by dividing their time, time activity. Shagun, are there any studies on diets of the two species? Do they separate that out? Do they select for different types of food? Yeah, yeah. Diet, there aren't any studies as such, but as a future recommendation, I would say diet analysis is a must to further say that what is actually favoring brown bear in temperate habitats apart from the alpines, so, uh, including the spatial temporal dieting diet would also strengthen our study in future. Thanks. <laughs> okay, Sandeep, you're up again. <laughs> no, you're muted. No, no, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, uh, my question is for uh, Buttercup, if uh, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. So um, in your study, you had shown that you have used camera traps uh, to estimate their population in some specific region. Uh, but I'm uh, interested to know what kind of method have you used? Uh, did you use any uh, capture recapture or uh, something else uh, to arrive at that number of, I think, 50 bears, uh, 30 to 50 bears for your region? Uh, yeah. The, the, just we collected our data, but this, during uh, the, my abstract, I did not well uh, uh, do any analysis, such as the, the capture recapture, but I will do now. It is, and the, our idea was the, just like a, the black bear. Study we saw the red the black bear study in, in Central Asia. So we, uh, based on that paper, we tried to identify and the shoulder mark, white marking. It is possible for the, it can be work on the Gobi bear, we decide. So independently, the uh, biologist worked on three biologists worked on that uh, identification. So we are just comparing, comparing our result. And in the future, we will do the recapture, capture, recapture method on it, trying also with combine the some genetic study. That's, that's really interesting because even if you can identify a few bear, with their marks, uh, you can also use uh, some partial identity models for that. And it'll be really interesting to see that kind of analysis with your data. Uh, so thanks for that. Back to uh, this too. Sorry, go ahead. I can give answer for that because uh, a recent paper of mine used the genetic approach and estimated the population size using uh, mark recapture, also special capture, uh, recapture, and then uh, actually it had very high uh, capture probability, and uh, the sampling method worked really well. But uh, as previously Marta said, it's good to combine the methods, and we also have camera trapping pictures, and able to see more of just in general clarify more of if there are some bears and also identify the ages too on the camera pictures. Yeah, but for genetic data, I already used those methods and uh, recently published the results on Ecosphere. Thank you. 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 Thank you
So, uh, uh, since both of you, uh, Udbair and Ambatok, talk, your study area seems almost uh, at the same place. Um, my question is more related to their ecology. Uh, so, when these bears disperse, uh, first, how often they disperse from one oasis to other? And when they disperse, do you know which kind of landscape or landscape feature they prefer? Do they prefer those? dry stream beds that Patoktok had shown in his uh, um, presentation or something else. And what's the season? Seasona is there any seasonality in this book? This question. So for uh, global bears, when we uh, looked at the telemetry data, it was mostly they were distributing through the mountain regions, but the places they show it's brown bears in general have very high home range. They travel a lot. They still go in um, those areas. And sorry, I didn't. Yeah, what was the first question? No, it was mainly regarding dispersal. So how far they disperse uh, and uh, what features they use. I think you have all the answered feature about features, but how far they do. So do they also we, on the genetic data, we were able to see where those bears are moving around because we collect simple different places and bears move around those places. And also special capture, recapture kind of like look at um, each individual's potential home range. Um, and in also with telemetry data showed in general, males have larger home range, spears more, and females mostly uh, have lower spears. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, in, in Batokto, in your presentation, you were saying that. You know these you had pictures and you said um you can clearly see these are different individuals but i have to say i had to pause it and stare at it and uh, you, there was a slide with six different individuals i could probably pick up two or three i wasn't very sure um you know um so that's why i guess you use these three different observers to classify but i didn't find it very easy um to distinguish individuals from camera trap pictures, but I also don't have experience. It's just a comment. Thank you. Thank you. The 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 white marking and uh, is a shape you you saw the very different shape. Uh, uh, we decided to rest on it and try to more experience choose it the more experienced. But I did just try to, because you, you know the Mongolia, we are nomadic people, so we know the uh, domestic animals too easily to identify. So somehow the, we can uh, try to identify based on it, the white mark. <laughs> but we will, yeah, again, before we talk it, we will support the biogenetic study. But most, uh, almost 80% of the population has uh, the, the very clear mark. Uh, only few is not much, no any mark, something like that. Sorry, my English is so not very. <laughs> no, no, I understand you fine. Um, but I guess it's it changes by the season. Once bears come out of hibernation and as they start gaining weight, um yeah i don't yeah, know how yeah uh, I see. yeah you know that we did our study in the summertime only because they're very high active during the june to august so we tried to divide uh, by one month by one month because the choosing losing the village yeah you know mm -hmm. the, so we decided to that in a short time we comparing all picture, something like that. So we work like that. And the shape of the uh, mark 
it's keeping the you saw some pictures the sun white mark is weak and sun is small so looks like a triangle something like that so it's keep like the snow leopard uh, spot <laughs> we, we <coughs> think like that so it's very different All right, do we have any more questions there from the audience? Then uh, the tuk tuk, I was fascinated by your camera setup on your the sticks in the ground. And I know that if I did that with, um, with grizzly bears here, they would destroy all five of those cameras <laughs> every single time. I'd be resetting constantly. Um, it didn't seem like that. Maybe you had one at your last picture that was sort of flipped up. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Did they destroy your cameras? Did they target in on them once they found them? Or Yeah, many times. They, every time they try to destroy. Because, so I more stone area put in, in many stone. I <laughs> just put in, try to use all the, our cameras with the iron box. It's uh, protecting the, <laughs> the sometimes the use uh, the bears use the uh, such a scratch. So is is it destroyed the camera lens on the in the hole? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I could see that being quite challenging. Right, yeah. Okay, we're just going to see if there's any other questions here coming in from the audience. Okay, I'll ask another one then. Shigan, um, I, the, your study seemed um, very interesting and I really enjoyed the overlap the, of all the species there. What future recommendations do you have for your work? You left there with a few questions. Yeah, so for the future recommendation, I would say we must go and look into diet patterns of both the bear species because in my study, I would say anthropogenic disturbances may be the reason, but yeah, diet analysis is a must and long-term research is also the need to say anything concretely as a future recommendation. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Trishna, did you have any questions there? Nope. Okay. Now, have you, I just have one for you here. It was, is there any way there's any hair left on any of those apiaries and I suppose it would be much too degraded to look at anything in the past with those bears. Is there any way to get to that, um, to any of the past uh, information on bear use of them? Can you repeat me the question please? Would there be any hair or anything left on any of the apiaries in that past damage, especially for extinct populations? Although I suppose it would be too degraded, but is there any way to get to um, a deeper understanding of bear use of these apiaries? colmenares en zonas donde no había osos o donde se había, ¿sabes? Uh, you ask me up, uh, between the relation between bears and the extinction population of bears and the distribution of the apiaries, you uh, speak, uh, you ask about this question. I yeah, I'm just wondering how, how we can get to, so you said there's scratches on the door, on the wood, 
of the ones in extinct populations. Are there any, is there any other way, um, would there be any past clumps of hair? I guess that that would be much too degraded, but something that for the bare use? Past like, bear use, just getting a, a, a deeper understanding of how bears use these, try to use them. All right, so basically you mean any biological sample? Any biological sample. And Marta would probably be better to know if it would, anything would be viable, I guess probably not with the time that's gone by, but. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems like it, it's, we're talking kind of a long time frame there, but um, yeah, so here they'll probably be, yeah, degraded, but, uh, and well, scouts even more, but yeah, uh, I don't know. Let's see what Javier says, but even just finding here, maybe it's difficult even finding them. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, the, the answer uh, that uh, Habit told me, uh, told me is that, yes, when uh, a bear tried to enter in those apiaries, uh, they often uh, let some uh, other signals than the marks in the doors, like, for example, hair uh, signals or also um, signals of the feeding. Uh, after, the, after the feed, you can find some, some signal of that. Uh, but that situation is usual. It's usual. Mm -hmm. And where are you at with protection status of them? Have you made any headway with that? What? Uh, I noticed you were trying to go for protection status of, of them. Where is that at currently? Uh, de la protección, o sea que además, eh, ¿dónde se, o sea, me refiero, creo que se refiere a la protección de, de los... De, de las colmenas. Sí. No, no tiene una protección especial la colmena, son el conjunto de... Es el muro que rodea todas las colmenas. Ok, de no hay, no hay protecciones especiales para la colmena. Ok, uh, have you told me that uh, there is not a special protection for the behaves, this, this is only the protection out of the beehives uh, with the apiary on the part on the uh, above part of the apiary that protect to not to enter the bear inside. But the uh, beehives inside the uh, the apiaries are uh, free from the. Antiguamente había algunas trampas para osos colocadas en la parte externa del apiary. Okay. Uh, Tradicional trampas de hoyo. Okay. In the old times, uh, there were some traps out of the uh, wall of the apiaries to uh, protect, to uh, an extra protection for the, for the entrance of the bears. Traps, holes, uh, uh, hole traps. Hole traps to capture bears. To capture the bears, yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's very interesting. What about world protection like from UNESCO, like actually protecting, conserving the site, uh, whether that be for future tourism or just to conserve the site. You showed the difference over um, a decade of, of de how they're degrading, like vegetation's growing on them. They're, they're starting to crumble. Is there any um, body, like a UNESCO body or something that's going to look at heritage protection? Uh, could you repeat, sorry? <laughs> no worries. Is there a body, um, like a, a governing body like UNESCO, that's going to protect the actual, yeah. conserve it on a, we're talking more global scale, maybe tourism happens there or something? I think it's better to protect. Uh, Creo que es mejor proteger los apiarios dándoles, recuperando su uso e incorporando eh, nuevas herramientas de protección como las hilos eléctricos. Okay. Yo creo que es más, más, útil, uh, más útil, más real. Ok, ¿cómo crees que es mejor recuperar el uso de estos apiarios como una tradicional use para proteger el bee farming que usar este tipo de... Ethno, ethnographic uh, construction for the tourism or something similar. So uh, 
the thing is that uh, Javi thinks that it's better to to use this this uh, consortium not only as a culture or uh, as a cultural heritage and also for uh, active active uh, protection and, uh, and activity. Yeah. Eh, sumando, añadiendo nuevas técnicas como las líneas eléctricas. Yes, also, also always uh, adding uh, actual uh, electric fences that are used in other parts of the Cantabrian mountains. Plus, uh, in the wall, in the wall. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, do we have any hands raised? No. Oh, cool. I have a question for you, Akko, switching here um, back to Mongolia. I'm wondering about enforcement. Do poachers get caught? And if they do get caught, what are the um, types of punishment that are enforced? Yes, there's the enforcement. In the, in the past, the law was not that strong. And when they are captured, they have to pay very low amount of money. But now, um, if they are captured, they can be in prison for several years, or they have to pay a lot of money because government kind of put a uh, for suspicious uh, uh, ecological economic value for uh, certain endangered species and then have to pay a lot of money for if they are captured. And, and do they get I can captured? say the number probably like six, seven times a year dollar. But um, females have more expensive if they have killed female bears. So the fine's higher if you kill a female. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's become more strict and yeah, law is more stronger. They have to pay. But the, the system is, uh, I need to understand a little bit more of those because mostly rangers find those or now there's a one government office there trying, you're trying to find those information but mostly rangers uh, figure it is one out and then shift it to police. And yeah, there's uh, some process there, but sometimes it's possible they just end up paying that and then not go to prison. Okay, thank you. Uh, and do I uh, want to add some more thing, you know, the. In the northern Mongolia, is the uh, southern edge of the Siberian taiga. So the, sometimes it's hard to grow the fruit and food. So sometimes they happen to start in the beer in uh, that area. So after that, in around the, the bear habitat area, there is a lot of livestock and it herders. Now, uh, now this getting the the conflict between the bear and herd is, is increasing in nowadays in Mongolia. So some poachers are uh, killing the bear in the area. Uh, uh, some uh, issues related with the, to um, to sell to China some power something like that for the Need it in something like that. So it's uh, such a problem happening in Mongolia. All right, do we have any questions from the audience coming in? There's a question in the chat from Cecily, and she says, uh, the question is, um, are the stone apiary structures actually effective at keeping bears out? Uh, this is for Javier. Um, are the stone apiary structures effective at keeping bears out? Can they be the new alternative to electric fences? 
Yes, even the, the walls, these walls and the appearance are effective uh, to keep your members out. Uh, then the most important thing is try to combine and use this uh, all the way to keep the birds out, combining with the electric fences. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, of these apiaries in the Cantabrian mountains, so we can use uh, these, uh, these ones that are in a good, uh, in a good uh, state to combine with these electric fences that, is, that are uh, now using. And uh, also we have we should uh, separate fences from the ground and the efficacy is good, it's better to do that. So what's the hesitation? Maybe I've forgotten, but why are they not being used anymore and what can be done to incentivize it? Like I can see a marketing strategy, um, you know, these uh, traditionally farmed honey, I would buy it. So what's the hesitation there why why are people not using it que okay. alguna manera eh, de, de fomentar el uso de esto o sea, por lo mejor eh, publicitándolo de alguna manera como es tradicional sí uh, sí esa es, la, esa es la idea no lo que pasa es que como estas construcciones están muy alejadas de los pueblos realmente han estado muy están fuera de las ayudas que tienen otro tipo de construcciones etnográficas o ríos okay. y demás. Entonces, yeah. Pero... <laughs> One of the problem to to publicitate this type of construction is that uh, they are uh, far away from the human settlements. So it's difficult to um, improve or um, do uh, helps or funds to to recover this uh, this type of uh, constructions. So pero no olvidadas, han estado muy olvidadas por las líneas oficiales yeah. de ayudas a cuestiones etnográficas. They were uh, forgotten for the official and administration's uh, grants to, to recover uh, traditional constructions. And the main reason is that they are far, far away from the human settlements. That is a problem to the people uh, from the uh, village now, nowadays to go there. So it's difficult to lose it. To, Used to uh, recover a traditional use. And all, yes, and have you told me that uh, they are also uh, forgo forgotten by the people who work with uh, ethnographic uh, things or uh, all cultural things in, in that part of the peninsula? Okay, I have an idea that I'll email you about. Okay. <laughs> Una idea que te escribirá. No, ok, thank you. <laughs> ok, ¿any more questions from anyone? Can I ask one question? No. Because Go for it. It's still time. Ok, so my question is uh, to Shagun. Uh, With uh, your camera trap data, do you have any plans to do uh, population estimation uh, for both bear species? I know that you can't identify them individually, but you can. Uh, there is the, the new techniques now where you can uh, get some sort of estimates. Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, I would definitely like to continue work as I also mentioned that long-term research is required to say anything precisely so yeah i would like to continue in the, this field and continue the work on population estimation if i could as well no i'm i meant the data that you already have um, um okay from okay yeah. camera trapping so yeah it so might the be data, useful yeah 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 it might be useful i would like to continue also but the data is somehow not that precise due to a lot of camera stealing issues have happened in the national park. So I would like to continue again and do it all over again. Yeah. So to get precise data set. Thank you. No problem. And uh, Otko and Batok Talk, uh, since uh, you have used uh, individually both methods, DNA and camera trapping to get pop population estimates, and Gobi bear is iconic species from Mongolia. If you have to monitor them for long term, for years to come, which one of these techniques is more preferred uh, 
without your individual bias, but more preferred in terms of logistic, money, accuracy, and all other factors. Thank you. Answer, or I can answer my opinion. <clears throat> um, so I have, you know, we collected samples since 2005 and for bit genetic approaches, so um, easy for long term monitoring because able to see which individual is found which year and then. In general, for long-term monitoring, genetic approach can be more of, um, can be useful. And also there's a more, um, for camera trapping information, it's so hard when your bears age and they can be changed and it's hard to see in different angles and see same individual can be two di different or like I'm a little bit worried for camera trapping for longer term monitoring for population estimate. For genetic estimate is to really give high accuracy of identifying individual and also able to use it for long term monitoring. And yeah. And also this can help a lot to understand in the future how the genetic diversity is changing over time. Yeah, and then I can answer a lot of different questions as well. And we are, yeah, we will do continue monitoring study on it in the uh, COVID desert. Uh, it's, yeah, somehow the, the advantage of camera therapy is uh, good. We can easily see the newborn cubs and the urine and female male and some uh, behavior also. You all of this hold uh, some uh, seasonal and um, daily activity. We can only based on in the camera trap uh, study. So in the future we will combine with uh, genetic and camera trap continuously how the more focus on demography and population size and uh, structure of population, something like that. And somehow the problem with the financial because they're very far from Mongolia uh, in Ulaanbaatar is uh, halfway is a thousand two hundred three hundred kilometer. So it's uh, too hard to come there and somehow, do you know, the camera trap monitoring, we need to change the batteries and SD cards every uh, third, three months. So we need, during our study, I go in a, one year, I must, uh, I go to the Gobi uh, six times. Every two months I go to, for change my batteries and SD cards, something like that. So <laughs> somehow the financial problem with us now. Mm -hmm. And no issues of people uh, stealing your camera traps? Because there is a strictly protected area, so there are no any uh, domestic animals, also no any uh, people. So our camera is safe. The, the bear only destroy, destroy the camera. So I we think it was, are, okay. Um, uh, we no, have, no, no, sorry, sorry, very sorry. The, about your question is the number of uh, camera, yeah? Or what was the question? No, no, I, I was just wondering if the cameras get stolen uh, while you're gone. But you have already answered that, so. Okay, okay. Thanks. So we are a little over time, but we let's take this one last question. Uh, this came through the chat from Julia Bevins for Patokta. 
The question is, um, I wondered about climate change and extreme heat in the Mongolian desert. Do you see changes from extreme heat events? How do you think this will affect Gobi bears going forward? I can't imagine navigating that unless there was adequate shelter. Yeah, still, I this, we can see this is the climate change in the Gobi desert because the, 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 in the summertime, there's uh, almost no any raining nowadays in recent years because the drought uh, time is continued last uh, for year. It was very dry. Of course, if there is no any enough plant and food, they, uh, it will be effect on the bear and also other animals, something like that. So it's the climate is uh, affecting in a uh, uh, wide diversity of the Gobi. I think it's my just opinion. Right. Well, thank you very much. I think, um, yeah, that was a great, great session. I really enjoyed uh, listening to everyone and hearing everyone's uh, responses and seeing the presentations. Trishna, do you have any parting words of wisdom? <laughs> no, I really enjoyed the session as well, all the talks, and thanks to everyone that asked questions. Special prizes to Martha and Sandeep. <laughs> Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> it was a so lot of fun. fun.